in the world, sisters and brothers, then my friends, today too we are going to start the, this Dhamma talk. May everyone give consent with three times, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse. Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse. Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse. Katami tayo dhamma parinyayati iti. Dear Venerable Sisters and Brothers, Dhamma Friends, Yesterday, in the first day of the retreat, we started this subject, that is to say, what are the three things one must understand thoroughly, one must know thoroughly. These are, this is the question Venerable Mahasariputta is asking from the uh, other fellow meditators. And uh, by directing the mind to the question of the audience, asking this question, what are the three things the meditators or practitioners must know thoroughly, he is preparing the ground and then he himself give the answer the Tisovedana. There are three kinds of feelings. That is the what uh, the practitioner, the yogi, the meditator should understand thoroughly. And uh, namely, the pleasurable feeling and uh, painful feeling. And uh, the third one is neither pain nor pleasure kind of feeling. So, before going into this subject directly, yesterday we tried to understand how this feeling related to our mindfulness or to Satipatthana. And as far as mindfulness is concerned, can we directly go into the feelings or should we take time to develop mindfulness first and with that kind of prepared mindfulness or already available mindfulness should we go into this subject of feeling. As far as the Satipatthana Sutta is concerned, that's a very famous one, known as the foundation of mindfulness. It first, the Buddha draw the attention to develop the mindfulness with the help of the body or the corporeality or with the materiality. That is to uh, go in the gradual basis, go in the pragmatic basis and furtherance in the same way of presentation, the Buddha practically he suggests take one's own body one's own corporeal body as the uh, object of meditation, and that is what it is called kāyānupassana idha bhikkhave bhikkhu kāye kāyānupassi vihrati. That's a very uh, famous phrase you find in the Satipatthana. Uh, that is to say, abides contemplating the body as a body, internally. So this is a kind of a challenging thing the Buddha suggests when we are using this body, when we are uh, dealing with the body, are we or individually am I looking at it as a heap of matter or consider it as uh, some other way, something like uh, object for pleasure and like a lever machine or as a uh, physical matter 
arranged in such a way like a backhoe machine or any uh, materialistic thing? Or are we looking at it as a heap of matter, that is to say, body? And therefore, whenever we are looking at our body in terms of mindfulness, it's a kind of a radical reflection we must have. Unless otherwise you go prepared, unless otherwise you are well advised, usually we are not looking at the body as the body the, the way the Buddha expected. So that is why in the practice of mindfulness, we take the body in terms of four postures. The starting point is the sitting posture and where we try to look at it without any volitional activity, without any willful action, just let the body to sit comfortably and look at it diligently and vigilantly. So that is the, that's what we call meditation. For that, we can't do it in our day-to-day -day course with the responsibilities. So we have to find a solitude place. That's why we uh, come long ways to find a place like this. And even when you come here, you must be thoroughly and well instructed to keep your body in the sitting posture and fully vigilantly and diligently observe it to see what is happening within the body. And there you may find it has some physical functions, verbal functions, and the mental functions. And each and every one has two uh, channels. One thing is intentional, other thing is unintentional, voluntarily and involuntarily. So here the restraint is, that is rather uh, advanced restraint compared to the morality, we keep as much as possible just to adhere to the uh, an involuntary action. Just let the thing happen and observe it. That observation is leading to contemplate body in body internally, so that is a kind of a new window opening uh, to look at it. So that is how the mindfulness sets in for a beginning. So you have to take a comfortable posture, make it symmetrical, relaxed, and fully observe, ironically with closed eyes, as to see what is happening with it. So when it is happening, it is hardly you can expect the observations are things that you can expect. So whenever you are observing it, uh, if you have preconceived ideas or premeditated ideas or any prejudices, it may be contradicting with this simple word meaning of mindfulness. So some people come out with the suggestion the, the bare attention is almost parallel with choiceless awareness. You be aware without any choosing, without any choice, evenly suspended attention, observe the body. So this is what called kai kai anupasi vihrati. So we are doing it. We have basic instructions and we have uh, question and answer session, discussions, because to learn how to look at the body as a body, we have to start like a beginner. Daily we have to have a beginner's mind and a lot of mistakes are happening. They are not called mistakes. They are called trial and error or we call noble quest. 
Arya you Pariyasan. So when and where mind is at home, when and where mind is here and now, when and where mind is ready for this choiceless awareness, uh, you may come across a lot of unexpected, un, uh, familiar things. So this is how you understand the body as body. So when this is happening, the, your focus or your attention is not on the worldly affairs, not on the past, not on the future, not on the other people, not on the other places, but here, now, I am. So there we start with the body as the frame, and where you can see the skin is the boundary. Within the skin, we call in, and beyond the skin, we call out. And when you are observing it, when and where the mind is within the body, we call we are mindful. Here, now I am. So much so, we can do away with the worldly worries, worldly frustrations, worldly problems pertaining to the outside. So this is a kind of a uh, great thing, according to the teaching of the Buddha, uh, depending upon the internal aspects of the body, you are ready to give up, you are ready to do away with external world. And when and where this mindfulness or this here and now situation verify that you are within the body, it does not indicate what you see is always pleasurable, always encouraging, always enthusiastic. Instead, there may be some unpleasurable, bored, monotonous, uncertainty can happen. So if you are well instructed, still you will be glad because still you are mindful. So you will not be hesitating to express or report when and where my mind is mindful or when and where I am mindful within the body, I observe, I feel, so and so. So that kind of uh, choiceless kind of reporting, very difficult to expect from a beginner, because beginner always expect pleasant, pleasant, always positive, always enthusiastic, always hilarious kind of feelings. But uh, that is not being assured specifically in this insight meditation. So therefore, uh, by doing trial and error slowly, slowly, you will learn how to observe with this choiceless awareness and how to report as the things are really. So when it is, when you are learning slowly, slowly this, kind of mindfulness that is called bare attention. That's a starting point of the mindfulness. In Pali, we can say sati matraya. You are a newly born baby. Your all prejudices, your all other knowledges, you are ready to give up. And just look at whatever arising with this mindfulness, as if a, a young child playing with the plaything got very recently and fully absorbed with that new thing and playing with it. Likewise, you are looking at your body completely as a newcomer or a beginner. So this is the way you learn the art of living without a stress. Maybe a split second, living without a frustration, because whatever happening is not your responsibility. You are a distance observer. You are just observing and reporting 
but you are not responsible about that because it is not your commitment. So nothing to commit. So this is how the bare attention going to give a kind of a relief and that very difficult to articulate, very, very difficult to communicate with the newcomer because newcomer, specifically if he or she is a young person, expects so much of results. That result-oriented mind naturally worried, naturally with the frustration. So we have to really appreciate they are just coming and taking this challenge, even with certain amount of boredom, even with certain amount of frustration. So they are uh, taking this trial and error itself, we see very, very uh, interesting, very, very important. Not that it is easier for the elderly people, task is equal, one has to be attentive, barely attentive on the body and see things as they are, as and when it arises. So you are observing and you try your best to report it in the interviews, to assuming your task as a distance observer. So when and where you are to observe the body with this kind of a mindset, you are bound to see the chronological changes or time series changes or evolution or revolution of this materiality because we are looking at it without any prejudices. So when you're observing the body, sometimes you may see the touching points. It's like a flat experience. And it is more boring, more frustrating, monotonous. Within that, uh, the flat experience, there may be wave-like experiences like in birth and out breath, rising and falling. So the beginner's mind or the beginner will be happy to have that kind of a wave-like observation than the flat kind of thing. Or some people can have both. While you observe that you are living, not dead, not sleeping and uh, here and now and there's one flat experience of just being you can see the some something like touching points in the bottom part of your body and within that within that canvas you can see the picture of in breath and out breath in like rising and falling of the abdomen and there you can see in-breath face versus the out-breath face. Or if you are focusing on the rising and falling, the rising face versus uh, falling face. It's something like physics. So when you're about to observe it continuously, that is to say, keep the mind face to face with this material object, the specifically in the wave-like thing, with your familiarity, you see it's depicting the beginning part of the wave and it is continuity of the wave and the cessation part of the wave. So this is what you call sankhara or what is called the conditional thing. Everything is having its own beginning, its own middle and its own end. One classic example one can be cited is if you are looking at a TV screen without a program, it's a lot of dots are appearing. Of course, modern televisions are not showing it also because it is uh, so tuned, but in the old, uh, old models, whenever you are not well focused, you can see dots and the screen full of dots at long gaping and observing, gazing, you can see it's a full of dots, but each and every dot has its own appearance and its own performance and its own disappearance. So despite 
to despite your border or monotonous observation of this lot of dots if you can focus upon one particular dot at least two things you can understand that is to say each and every dot without missing showing its appearance and its performance and its disappearance never miss that point the second thing is two dots are never clashing each other they are independent observations likewise within the body when you are observing so much of things are happening as far as you are not adding anything willfully as far as you are not adding anything volitionally you can observe they are happening in all in its own accord and it has its beginning the middle and the end so this is a kind of advancement in your mindfulness and as far as you keep on mindful you can see the so much of things are happening but each and every one is sharing the same character that is to say the appearing mode the performing or changing mode and then disappearing mode but unless otherwise you are instructed hardly your mind naturally observe the cessation part cessation part is considered as unauspicious therefore cessation part is very hidden so their focus is not the beginner's mind or this is not the bear attention it must be very advanced kind of attention not only keeping the materiality in face to face but take its integral part one particle it's appearing and its performance and disappearance and when you are to observe the disappearance you can see how much our observation is entertaining the appearance part than the disappearance part this is what you call the sansaric journey this is a perpetuation of our sansara fail to understand the disappearing part unless otherwise your mind is adverted focused directed to the disappearance even though it is it get the equal chance to have the appearance face and the disappearance face our observation is partial is biased prejudiced it is not your personal character whether you are a male or female whether you are a young or old whether you are a learned or not whether you are devotional or not irrespective of that as a one universal character our mind is projecting and uh, looking away from this disappearance part so if you are bored and if you are monotonous and if you are not instructed easily you can get up and go never you go never you reach up to that level of mindfulness so that is why the the sustaining of the mindfulness repetitive application of the mind and uh, regular practice this is very important for the advancement of the mind before going to feelings still we are now in the kaya anupassana or mindfulness on the corporeality imagine the one day you become clear in your mind the phenomena whatever it may be physical or mental it, it is characteristic characterized with this the beginning part the middle part and the disappearance part and the day you understand or day you realize the mind is naturally hesitant or backward or there is a kind of a phobia to see the disappearing side therefore it always happy to jump into the appearance part or samudaya or rising part than the disappearance so therefore you must have a certain amount of patience certain amount of preparedness that amount of clarity in your observation and you can't expect that in a beginner's mind 
So with that kind of a thing, with that kind of attitude, this, that kind of a preparedness when you observe, continue, or you continue to observe, later you may find the disappearance part or cessation part is uh, naturally part and partial of the phenomena, but it is due to our uh, phobia. That's a kind of a uh, hesitation. We are not looking at it, but if you are go prepared, there's no difficulty. There is no uh, distraction for you to observe. So that means you are thoroughly engaged, penetrating into the object, so much so you become free from these worldly worries, worldly suffering, worldly frustration. Instead, you penetrate into the object or penetrate into the phenomena so that your mindfulness will be sharp enough and it become very continuous and uh, often it may be get distracted, but then and there you find your times, you, the time you spend with the primary object is getting elongated, not only in quantity, but in quality also. And the, the moment when you are skillful to understand this or to observe this, the disappearance part, it's giving so much of charge, so much of energy to the inside meditation. So it is, you learn the art by trial and error, slowly, slowly, little by little. And there are, whether the thing you are observed is pertaining to the earth element, the hardness and the softness, or whether it is related to the liquidity, the fluidity or cohesiveness, or whether it's related to the heat element, the heat and cold, or whether it's related to the air element, the expansion and contraction and the uh, movement. Each and everyone is undergoing this, the rising part, the transitional part and the disappearance. And ultimately you can see the materiality as such irrespective of these four elements or any bodily parts or any other categories. So this is a kind of a uh, workable and advanced state of mindfulness. With that, you are now qualified to go into immaterial things. So uh, matter in Pali we call Rupa, with the help of matter, when you develop a certain amount of mindfulness or momentum of mindfulness, continuity of mindfulness, undistract kind of mindfulness, the, now we can use it to the immaterial thing called Nama. And there are, a lot of aspects are there. Whenever the Buddha presenting to Nama part or the immaterial part, he starts with these feelings. It may be feelings or perception or any uh, volitional activities or the consciousness itself. The, in gradual development, next one is the feeling. So after dealing with this kaya, kaya, anupasi, viharati, that first part of the uh, four foundation of mindfulness, you slowly, slowly become qualified to go into this feeling side that is called Vedana Anupassana. And if you continue with this Satipatthana Sutta in the Majjhimanikaya number 10, you can see the Nirinda Buddha indicates there are three kinds of feelings, just like in the Dasuttara Sutta, the quotation what we have already got. And it says, when you're observing feelings, it is different from materiality. And to have, it is not a single unified thing. Within that, at least three lobes. The pleasurable feeling, painful feeling, and neither pleasure, no pain kind of feeling we call the medium kind of feeling. 
equanimous kind of feeling. So during the time of the Buddha, there were a lot of uh, arguments or discussions on this feeling and there were some groups, they, saw, they see and they believed only two kinds of feeling, that's a pain and pleasure. So they were under the impression the, according to the Buddha's teaching, only two kinds of feelings, pain and pleasure. And there were another kind of group, another group within the within Buddhist practitioners, there are three kinds of feeling, pain, pleasure, and neither pain nor pleasure. So they were fighting, they were arguing each other. I, according to my understanding of the Buddha, it's only two feelings. The other part is this, no, 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 you people are not listening carefully. If you listen carefully, there are three kinds of feeling. Uh, pleasurable feeling, painful, fe painful feeling, and neither pleasure nor pain kind of feeling, so they were debating. And the third party came, no, no, there are five feelings, that is to say, uh, physical, pleasurable, physical, painful, and uh, mental pleasurable, mental painful, and added with this neither pain, neither no pleasure, five kinds. So there was a lot of debates and arguing. Ultimately, it went into clashes. Then the Buddha indicate, so when and where such a categorization going to happen, so there may be, but it depends on the circumstances. I being the Buddha or omniscient one, I can tell it in the two ways. I can express in the three, I can express as five, or I can expand as I like. So therefore, try to understand when and where you apply mindfulness to the feelings, it diversifies, it evolves, it is not permanent, changing. You must apply mindfulness with this open mind. So even at the beginning, pain and pleasure is good enough to start with. But when you are continue to do, whenever it is changing from pain to pleasure, or pleasure to pain, there is a gray area that is also interesting enough, even though our mind is uh, overlook it, make the majority of our time. But we have the pleasure principle always chasing behind the pleasure. So we love pleasure. We hate pain. So we are always with frustrated mind or uh, kind of a tension always there. Even with the present day whole technology and the infrastructure, the humanity as such always chasing behind this pleasure. That's called pleasure principle. So therefore, uh, they, it is, they will not accept this intermediate kind, no, neither pain nor pleasure kind of feeling. So unless otherwise you look at it mindfully, patiently, and not with one observation, not with one sermon, not with overnight, again and again, then only, as Venerable Sariputta indicates, there are three things you must be thorough in understanding. That is to say, one part of the feeling is pleasurable, one part is painful. There is yet another one that is to say, neither pain nor pleasure. So when and where are you to discreetly understand it, delimited it, it's a vast subject. I would say it's more than the materiality, it's a vast subject. And you go deep into the layers of the mind, an understanding of the meditation and mindfulness become more and more sharp when it is changing from materiality to the mentality, taking the pain, uh, sorry, taking the feeling as a subject. So that is the part we will be uh, advancing now onward. So therefore the Satipatthana itself is introducing these three kinds. And furtherance it says, there are two categories. One thing is that worldly kind of pain, worldly kind of pleasure, and a worldly kind of 
no pain, no pleasure. And there's another complete different sphere for the renounced people. For the full-time meditators, they also have kind of immaterial kind of a pleasurable feeling, immaterial kind of painful feeling, and immaterial kind of neither pain nor pleasure kind of feeling. So we being meditators, we start with our normal worldly understanding, the pain, pleasure, and no pain, no pleasure, neutral feeling. So when you are mindful, when and where you face to face your primary object, it may be material, it may be your breath, it may be your rising and falling, it may be your sitting posture, it may be your walking posture, it may be your left leg touch of the ground and the right leg touch of the ground. They are there is a kind of a pressure when and where mind face to face with the object. It is not happening through eye, or eye, or eye faculty, seeing things. It is not by listening good music. It is not by smelling good thing or tasting something with your tongue. It is not kind of a tactile sensation in the body. It is not the mental part. It is not merely mental. It is practical, pragmatic thing. When and where you are continuing with mindfulness, that's a kind of a pleasure. That is the way we can understand. It's an unworldly kind of thing. Immaterial kind of a pleasure happens. But immediately when it is lost, when your mindfulness gets distracted, when you are that uh, trend is broken, it becomes a pain. It is not due to loss of your child. It is not due to a loss of your property. It is not of anything, but your mindfulness is broken. Already your mindfulness is broken, then you have a pain. And there is another part, there's no... It's a gray area. You can't say it's a pain or pleasure in the monastic life, in this meditative life. So likewise, when and where you can understand and discreetly and in the delimited manner, that is a kind of a sharpening of your mindfulness, going beyond materiality and go into the Vedana Anupassana, contemplation in pain, on pain. So this is... Uh, not limited to a particular religion, particular area, particular uh, sect, particular language. So that is you are opening wide doors into the human mind. So Satipatthana itself is inviting you to be aware and observe in a choiceless manner all the kind of feelings and they are when we are furthering in this discourses and in the talks, we can see why we can't have equal approach or evenly suspended attention or suspended decision to observe these different feelings. Each, each one of us is undergoing this difficulty, that is to see the masities and to report the masities when and where these feelings happen, more than materiality, I would say, it is dragging us into either pleasure or pain. So therefore, our report is completely biased, prejudiced. So much so, we have to do it again and again till we can give a, a scientific kind of report. As and when it happens, see discreetly, and that is the challenge when we are going into this thorough understanding of the feelings. So, in the uh, if I am to call another uh, supportive particular discourse known as Chullavedala Sutta, still in the middle, then sayings, there is a nice discussion between uh, uh, Sister Tamadina and the uh, Upasaka, the lay practitioner called Visaka, they used to be a married couple before, 
and after they renounced, the sister became fully enlightened and uh, his early husband, Visakha, uh, they meet each other and even then Visakha is having a kind of idea, ladies cannot be enlightened. There may be some pretense, so therefore he go and cross-question his early wife or the present sister, Damadina, and therefore this discussion is very lively and it's known as Vedalla Sutta and it's been translated as a discussion, question and answers. So the Visaka Upasaka is asking, sister, what are the, how many kinds of feelings? Then the sister Damadina is telling there are three kinds of feelings. And then the Visaka, the Upasaka is asking, what are these? And then the same answer, the pleasurable feeling and the painful feeling and no pain, no pleasure kind of feelings. And uh, Visaka, being a continental practitioner, is asking a very creative kind of a question. He's asking what is the pain and pleasure of pleasurable feeling? Just read the question. Just see the question. What is the pain and pleasure or desirable part and the undesirable part of the pleasurable feeling? Or we can say what are the black part and the white part of the pleasurable feeling? And then the Sister Dhammadina is telling the appearance and the sustenance of the pleasurable feeling, pleasurable, yes. But its disappearance of the pleasurable feeling is painful. So that is the part the Visakopasaka wanted to highlight. And for that only he raised the question in such a way, what is the pain and pleasure of the pleasurable feeling? Or what, are, what is the desirable part and the undesirable part of the pleasurable feeling? Unless otherwise you ask, ask this kind of a creative question, you think pleasurable feeling is utterly, absolutely pleasurable. But Vishakha Pasaka want to highlight even there are some disadvantages or negative side, black side or the pleasurable feeling. So he verily asked the question, what is the pleasure and pain of the pleasurable feeling? And the sister Dhammadina is explaining the arising and the sustenance part of the pleasurable is pleasurable. But the disappearance of that very pleasurable feeling is painful, I think. We can understand in a deductive way, in a rational way. So this is what it happens. So imagine when you are meditating, when and where kind of a pleasurable feeling happen, not to rush and engross and embrace it with the wholehearted goodness, but to see patiently the disappearance part of the pleasurable feeling. For that only, we have to learn what is the disappearance part of the in-breath, what is the disappearance part of the out-breath, what is the disappearance part of the rising mode of the abdomen, what is the disappearance part of the falling part of the abdomen. They are at the intensity of pain and pleasure, desirability, undesirability is not so prominent, but your mind is trained. Mindfulness is sharp. So therefore, with that understanding, if you are to apply the same to the pleasurable feeling, whenever you gain kind of a continuous mindfulness, maybe a certain amount of concentration, maybe a certain amount of insight knowledge, you will be elated, be glad and happy to have that kind of a positive, pleasurable, white kind of feeling. But, but it is natural, it become otherwise change into, and when and where it is disappearing, when and where your mindfulness distracted, disturbed, when and where your concentration distracted, when and where your trend of the knowledge 
distracted, definitely, equally you will be painful. And that is natural. But the thing is, how do you attribute it to? Do you think it is a natural thing, it's a nature, the feelings are impermanent? Or you may say, my mindfulness distracted, someone made noise. My mindfulness distracted because of outsiders, maybe climate, maybe other fellow meditators, maybe other creatures. So always you make yourself whitewashed and find fault with outside that my mindfulness would have continuous unless otherwise this unexpected distraction happen and it disturbed my mindfulness so much so you become uh, develop repercussions and in a chatter and it is always do with the sick mind because you never expect the pleasurable feeling to uh, change transitional part so therefore learning it through this Chulavedala Sutta carefully understanding the question of Venerable Visaka uh, the Upasaka Visaka what is the pain and pleasure of pleasure of the pleasurable feeling, the question appears somewhat irrational. Question appears somewhat not grammatical. But the answer the sister Dhammadina is giving, the arising and the, the persistent of the pleasurable feeling is pleasurable, yes, but it disappears. When it is disappearing, when it ceases to exist, so always painful. And then the Upasaka is leading further with the purpose. He's asking what is the pain and pleasure of the painful feeling. The answer is theoretically and in the linguistically is equal. The appearing and the pertaining persistent of the painful feeling is pain, painful. But the disappearance of the painful feeling is a pleasure. So what is the implication, what is the practical implication? We are much worried about the disappearance of the pleasurable feeling and we cry and we lament and we do all the kind of thing. But if you are observing your five minutes observation of your sitting meditation or walking meditation, often you are bombarded with painful feeling. As and when it happens, you become worried, you become negative, sour in taste because you are impatient to see the disappearance of the painful feeling. The disappearance of the painful feeling is the pleasure. That's the thing, that's the point you are missing. You miss the bus. So if you are patient enough, if you are mindful enough, if you are with this preparedness, attentiveness, let the painful feeling appear in its own accord and just observe it without a regret or without negative feeling because the arising happened due to its own cause and the disappearance of the painful feeling also happened its own accord without your involvement. So when the disappearance of the painful feeling come into being, once you discern, you see it's a gift. It's an endowment. It's a reason to be glad. And that is the what we never experience unless otherwise we practice mindfulness. We go with the prepared mind, instructed mind, and to ponder into the, the disappearance side of the painful feeling. And you can see how many agents around us to take care about our painful feeling and they will come out with this and that kind of opinions and ideas and they will suggest in order to get rid of this kind of painful feeling you have this and that kind of suggestions. They will be never happy, our so-called agents are not happy to say the disappearance of the painful feeling happening by its own accord, they are just come to distract you. Distract your patience 
just to see the disappearance part, the last phase of the painful feeling. So you become so engrossed with the repercussions and all kinds of things. So you are impatient to see the disappearance of the painful feeling. The day you understand the way to it, you understand you are born with that endowment, you are born with that uh, knowledge, but we have not been directive, directed or adverted our mind in a, such a specific and discreet way. That is the way our, the Vasishta Dhammadina is leading uh, Upasaka Visakha's attention according to the teaching of the Buddha. That is what Venerable Sariputta is asking us in this Dasuttara Sutta, please be thorough, know thoroughly about these feelings, not its tip of the iceberg, just underneath, submarine area of the feelings, pleasurable feeling end up with the pain, painful feeling end up with the pleasure. In both the cases, we miss the bus because we are quite worried and engrossed with the arising part of the both, but we never be patient, be mindful, be choicelessly aware, be evenly with the suspended attention to see how quickly they are in the transition. Pleasure change into the pain, pain change into the pleasure. So the day you understand, the day you advert your mind, the day you avenue your mind to look at the end part of the painful feeling, the end part of our cessation part of the pleasurable feeling, you will be seeking a painful feeling to arise so that you can see from the beginning through the middle to the end. Because you know end is pleasurable. And when and where the pleasurable feeling happens, you will see from the beginning through the middle to the end to see it is end up with pain. And that moment, point, only at that point you will see most of your stream of consciousness not engrossed with pain and pleasure. There are huge gaps, big chunks without pain or without pleasure. So more and more you are to observe pain discreetly from the pleasure and the beginning discreetly from the cessation, you see most of the time your mind is without any kind of a black and white difference with the pain and pleasure, huge most of the time or majority of the time mind is with no pain, no pleasure. That is what we call boring. That's what we call very, very monotonous. That is what we call very, very uncertain, very, very challenging, and very, very painful. So the day you understand the pain, pain and pleasure never leads to Nibbana. Only the no pain, no pleasure kind of feelings are the doorway to the middle path. So, isolating them from the pain and the pleasure is a such a grave task because our mind is always behind the pleasure principle. So much so we hate pain. So we are worried, our worrying mind, superficial mind is make the story completely out of pain and the pleasure. So you miss the bus in between and even if it appears, it appears like boredom. It appears like monotonous. It appears like lethargic. It appears like very, very uncertain. Very, very cornered. Very, very outcasted kind of thing. So meditative life is boring. Meditative life is very, very monotonous. Meditative life is very, very cornered life outcasted like. So how can we make young children be mindful? 
elderly people, they have certain amount of understanding regarding the day-to-day -day life. So therefore, they understand the boredom and other things are part and partial of the life. But the early phase of your life, youngsters, adults, teenagers, very difficult to keep them, meditate, and to give certain amount of maturity to the mindfulness because our mind is always with the pleasure principle. So therefore, any person, maybe young or old, just doing this experiment, this noble quest, it's very, very religious, very, very auspicious, very, very precious. So therefore, we must have a mindset, we must have our preparedness, we must have our theoretical understanding, we must have our question and answer session, we must have sustaining, repetitive application, then only one day we can reach and have a kind of then and their happiness, then and their gladness, not due to mere pleasure, but due to the direct approach and understanding the Dhamma, understanding the phenomena. So it is kind of an immaterial kind of pleasure. So how much you must strive, how much you must sustain to apply your mind, it is up to uh, the responsibility of each of us. So stopping at that level, I would like to sum up the today's talk and with that background, we'll try to go forward uh, tomorrow. So I hope this theoretical part of the knowledge and your practical experience so far you have gained will help promote to experience these things in your sittings, walking, and day-to-day -day activities. Having that hope in our mind, I would like to sum up the today's talk. Thank you very much for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.